this up so everybody can see. Do that. All right. Today, we are going to continue in chapter three. And let me make sure I get this all on the screen. All right, so we are in three point, whoops, 3.2 today. And we are going to be looking at graphing using first and second derivative. And we've done graphing, we've, we've introduced looking at a graph using the first derivative. And if you recall what the first derivative does, so the first derivative allowed us or allows us to see the slope, whether it be increasing or decreasing, depending upon if it's positive or negative, and the extrema. And here I'm talking about the maximum or minimum of the graph. So that's what we learned and we talked about in section 3.1. So we're just going to expand on that. So now what we're going to look at is what the second derivative and what the second, second derivative gives us is what is called concavity and inflection points. So these are the two new concepts that we will be exploring today. Something out of my drawer that will hopefully help us see this. So I'm kind of being innovative on what I use in my office and you'll see what I'm talking about here in a little bit. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a picture. Okay, so in 3.1, we talked about the tangent line. So I'm gonna use this, I was just using this paper clip to make a line. And if I was looking at the tangent line, I would choose any point here. And as we can see, any point here that that tangent line is decreasing, which means it would be less than zero or negative. And then it would hit a critical value right here for which your first derivative would be equal to zero because your uh, slope would be zero. And then it would begin, the slope would begin going up, which means it is increasing at any tangent line here. And then of course it would hit zero again. And then it would be less than zero because it begins to decrease. So that's just kind of to be helpful to give you kind of a visual on what we did in 3.1. Now, in 3.2, when we're talking about the second derivative, we're going to talk about concavity, which what concavity shows is a curl or a bend. Curl or a bend. Move this up. So here's what I'm talking about. If you have something like this, as you can see, is if, if you had a straight line and then I bent this, I would bend this to where it would curl up. Curl up or curl upward. And so when we think of a curl upward, think up, typically up makes me think greater than zero. So what that would tell me is 
My second derivative is greater than zero, which we know that means that my second derivative is a positive number, okay? And then we could have an example, or if you had a straight line and it began to bend or curl down or curl downward, then in this case, our second derivative is going to be a number less than zero, which basically means our second derivative is a negative number. Now, you can think of this as a smile is greater than zero, a frown is less than zero. And so concavity, we're gonna look at um, if it's greater than or equal to zero, all right? So we have several different situations and now we're talking about the first derivative and the second derivative. So you have to be able to distinguish between the two because, let me show you, let's say we had a function f of x that did this, okay? So what is happening here is first, if I was going to ask myself, what is the first derivative doing? Well, remember that is your slope at any tangent line. So if I did a tangent line any he anywhere here, I can see that this is always going upward or increasing. So I know that would be greater than zero. Then the second thing I wanna look at is what's going on at the second derivative. Is it going to be a positive or a negative number? So now I have to think concavity, which I think, okay, how is my line bending? So if I had a straight line, it is bending and you can kind of see or think of this, this would continue to bend upward, which means we have a smile. Therefore the second derivative concaves up, so it is greater than zero as well. Now, so when you look at this, you go, oh, well, if one of them is greater than zero, the other one is as well. Well, that is not always true. That's where you have to be careful. Let's look at a second example of a function that's slightly turning and it is going upward as well, but let's take a look at our first derivative and that's the tangent line. So any point here, I can see that would continually go upward. So just as my first example, my first derivative is greater than zero. But think about concavity. If this continued, it would eventually concave down, which means we have a frown. So what that tells me is the second derivative is less than zero for a negative number. Why? Because it concaves down. So if you'll notice in this one, the first derivative is greater than zero, but the second derivative is less than zero. So you have to be careful. Um, a couple of other, I'm kind of running out of room, so I'm gonna to try to get this on here. All right, so the first derivative, as you can see, my tangent line is going down or decreasing. So that would be less than zero. So then I wanna know if it concaves up or down. So I'm gonna look at this as well. If this extended on, I would get a smiley face. So that means it concaves up which means it is greater than zero. And then the other one we wanna look at would be like this. So the first derivative, again, my handy dandy paper clip, my tangent line, that line would continually decrease. So the first derivative that means my slope would go downward or be going decreasing or negative. So it's less than zero. Whereas my second derivative, I'm curious what is the concave. So if I visualize this as 
continuing on, obviously that is downward or a frown. So that would tell me that it is less than zero because it concaves down. So now you're having to look at two different things when we're looking at the first derivative and the second derivative. Now, the first derivative gave us critical numbers. And remember at those critical numbers, you look to see if it was a relative minimum or maximum. Well, trying to get my notebook paper. Okay, so with the second derivative, what we're looking for is what is called inflection points. And this is a point on the curve. where the concavity changes. It's where the concavity changes. So if I go back to this picture here, if you'll notice here I have a concave up and then I have a concave down. So somewhere in here, somewhere in here, it was concave up and then it changed and became concave down. So this would be what we would call an inflection point. Whereas if you recall from 3.1 here that deals with first derivative, this is when the first derivative is equal to zero. This is a critical number this would be a critical number. And of course, this would be a relative max. This would be a relative uh, minimum. So now what we're looking at is where does the concavity change? And that would be at what we call an inflection point. Now, when does this happen? This happens when, and this is similar to critical numbers, they happened when the first derivative was either equal to zero or does not exist or undefined. And so concavity or inflection points occur. Now we're looking at the second derivative will be either equal to zero or is Undefined is what I believe WebAssign calls. It also means does not exist. All right. So let me give you three pictures. Um, Hang on just a second. Okay, so let me give you an example like that. An example like that. And an example like that. Okay. So again, looking at the definition, it's a point on the curve where, and so what is important? The concavity changes. So it means it was concave up and then it went concave down or it was concave down and then went concave up. So here, if you'll notice, if I look at my graph here, this is concave down and then it changes to concave up. So we would have an inflection point right here. Now, on this one, uh, initially students would go, well, well, here it is right there. That's gotta be an inflection point. Well, think through the definition. The concavity has to change. Here we have concave down and here we have concave down. It can't go down, down. It has to go concave down to concave up or vice versa. So in this case, no inflection point. 
And this last one, we go, okay, this is concave up. And then here we have concave down. So yes, this would be an inflection point right there. Okay. All right. So what we're going to look at is an example. And we're going to go through the steps to get to inflection points and how to find those. So let's start with an example, and I'm going to give you the function f of x equals x to the fourth minus 2x cubed. Now, I look at this and I go, okay, this is a polynomial function. So I know my domain x, the input can be negative infinity to infinity. All right, so then I also know I'm going to be dealing with equal to zero and not have to worry about when it's undefined because I don't have a denominator, all right? So the first thing that we're gonna do, which tells us if our tangent line is increasing or decreasing, is we are going to take a look at the first derivative. So that would be 4x cubed minus 6x cubed squared. And then as we learned in 3.1 that we're going to find the critical numbers which is where the first derivative is equal to zero. So I am going to set this equal to zero and I'm going to solve for x. So I have a greatest common factor of 2x squared, which gives me 2x minus 3. So I have 2x squared equals 0 or 2x minus 3 equals 0. So I know my x for this is I divide by 2 and then take the square root of both sides. In essence, it's just 0. Here, I would add 3 and then divide by 2. So I would get 3 halves, which we know is 1 and a half. So these are, are our critical values or critical numbers. All right. So again, we're dealing with the first derivative here. All right. So just like we did in 3.1, I am going to create a number line. And this is my first derivative. And I know that I have critical values at x equals zero and x equals three halves or one and a half, okay? And I know at these points that the first derivative was equal to zero. All right, so now I wanna know what is the behavior here Increasing, decreasing, increasing, decreasing, increasing, decreasing. Let me get my calculator. I think all right so i'm going to choose a number to the left of zero so i'm going to choose negative one so again this is the first derivative i'm not going up to the original function so i'm going to substitute negative one in for here so i'd have four times negative one cubed minus six times negative one squared and again all i'm interested in is its sign and it is negative so that tells me the first derivative is less than zero which tells me that my graph is decreasing here then I'm going to choose a number between zero and one and a half and the easiest to me is one and I'm going to substitute that back into the first derivative and it is going to give me a negative number so this first interval, it was decreasing right here because this is equal to zero. I know it's a horizontal line. And then now it is decreasing again. And then at zero, it is a horizontal line. And now I wanna see what is going on in this interval right here. So I'm gonna just use the number two substitute that in to this first derivative 
and it gives me a plus, which means that this is increasing. All right, so this is similar to what, or actually it's what we did in the 3.1. And so I get an idea of what my graph is doing. And then I go, okay, what about any relative minimum or relative maximum? Well, it does hit here, but since it doesn't continue up, it decrease, decrease, then I am looking for a relative minimum at three halves. So to calculate where the relative minimum is, It's at x equals 3 halves. And now I want to generate what point is that at. So the point generator is your original function. So I'm going to substitute this in and go back to my original function and do 3 halves to the fourth power minus 2 times 3 halves to the third power. And that gives you negative 27 over 16. So this point on my graph would be at 3 halves, negative 27 over 16. And now before we go to Desmos, we're going to take that a step further because now we want to look at concavity and inflection points. So to do that, we need the second derivative. All right, well, my first derivative is here, so its second derivative would be 12x squared minus 12x. And concavity occurs at, or our inflection points occur at um, when this is either equal to zero or does not exist. And since it is a polynomial function, I'm going to check it for inflection points for where it is equal to zero. Factor out the GCF of 12x, which would give me x minus 1. And so those both set equal to zero. So I know my inflection points will possibly occur at zero and one. So the second derivative is where I'm looking for inflection points. First derivative, critical values are critical numbers. Second derivative, inflection points. So just like the first derivative, we're going to create a number line, but now we're looking at the second derivative. And I know that at x equals 0, that my second derivative is equal to 0. And at x equals 1, my second derivative is equal to 0. So what I want to know is what is going on in each one of these intervals, okay? So I'm going to choose a number, and again, we're doing the second derivative to the left of this, negative 1. Between these two, 0 and 1, I'll probably do 1 half. And then to the right of 1, I'm going to do 2. And again, what I'm interested in is their sign. So I'm going to substitute negative 1 in up here and see what that value is in its sign, and it's going to come out to a positive number. So that tells me the second derivative is greater than 0, which means it concaves up. Then I'm going to substitute 1 half into my second derivative, and I get a negative. And so that tells me my second derivative is less than zero. So I know it concaves down. And then I'm going to substitute two in up here and it gives me a positive. So I know that the second derivative is greater than zero, which means it concaves up. 
Now, remember, inflection points occur when it switches. If it goes from up to down or down to up. If it goes concave down, concave down, then we don't have an inflection point. Well, if you'll notice here, it goes from up to down. So I know that this is an inflection point at x equals one. Here it goes from down to up. So that tells me that at x equals one, that that is an inflection point as well. So you're looking for that change of direction. So to find where the inflection points are at, we know one is at x equals zero. So again, now I go back to the original function because I'm doing a point generator. So I would have zero to the fourth minus two times zero cubed, which we know that is zero. So this gives me the point zero, zero. And then we would do x equals one. So we need to, whoops, put a one in there because we need output. So we would have one to the fourth minus two times one cubed, which equals negative one. So this gives us the point one negative one. Okay, now before we go to Desmos, I noticed I neglected to do something on my previous page. Here I drew decrease, so it was less than zero, decrease, so the first derivative is less than zero, increase, the first derivative is greater than zero. So if you want that put in your notes. Okay, so now we're gonna go to Desmos. So I need to stop share and I need to go to Desmos. Okay, so we are going to graph this and we are gonna look at the relative minimum and the inflection points. So the original is y equals x to the fourth minus two x cubed. Okay, so there we have our graph. And so if you go back to the first derivative, so we had um, where x equals um, zero. So a critical number was where x equals zero right here. We had a decrease and then it decreases. And then we talked about this point right here being our relative minimum, which was at the point three halves and negative 27, whoops, not an A, 16th. And you'll notice right, whoops, sorry. Okay, there we go. So right here at this point is our relative minimum. Then we went on to look at and we found the inflection points, okay? Now, Notice that here we're now looking at concavity. So from here, this part of the interval was concave up and then it switched to concave down. So we have an inflection point at zero, zero because it was concave up and then it went concave down. And then our next inflection point was at one, negative one, because we had concave down. And then this is where it switched. At this point in the red is where it switched and started to be concave up. So that is what our um, first and second derivatives give us. So now we're gonna expand on that and see where that gets applied and is applicable to see benefits for. Okay, so in business, you'll hear the terminology point of diminishing returns. 
Now, what this is, this represents the end of growth, so growth that is accelerating, meaning going at upward at a, a large slope, okay? And the beginning of growth that is slowing. So they both have growth, but one's at an accelerating rate and one is slowing. So let me show you what that looks like. Let's say that you have a business and you're going to be investing money in advertising either a product or your business, and the output will be the profits for that. Okay, so what we want to look for is what is called the point of diminishing returns. So if you'll notice, of course, my tangent line is negative. It hits zero. And then my tangent line begins to accelerate at each point. If you'll notice, it accelerates. And then it eventually hits a point to where that tangent line is still growing, but not as steadily. And so here it is growing, 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 and then it's going to hit a point to where, yeah, it's still growing, but not at the high acceleration as it was. This is what we call an inflection point because we had concave up, concave down, and at this point, we call our point of diminishing return. So when you are doing your assignments, when WebAssign says find the point of diminishing return, it's asking you to find the inflection point, which means I have to consider the second derivative. Those are kind of the words you need to watch for in your hints. All right, so let's look at an example. So let's let X equal hundred, a thousand dollars spent on advertising. And we are given R of X. So this is a revenue function of 30 X squared minus two X cubed plus 100. And it's gonna give me a restriction on my domain from zero to nine. So this means zero money spent on advertising, nine in hundreds of thousands would mean $900,000 is spent. And you may be asked, find the point of diminishing returns. So the key is when you see this right here, point of diminishing returns, you know it's asking you for an inflection point. Okay, well, what have we just learned? When do inflection points occur? Inflection of points occur when the second derivative is equal to zero or does not exist. And so since we have a polynomial function, it's gonna be when the second derivative equals zero. So notice it's not asking me for what's going on at the first derivative. It's not asking for a relative minimum or maximum. Now, that being said, you're gonna to have to find the first derivative to get to the second derivative. So we're gonna take this function and we're gonna find, whoops, not it. F, I'm going to do, we're going to find the first derivative, which will be 60x minus 6x squared. Now, if you were asked for your critical numbers or your critical values, then you would set this equal to zero and then be able to find your relative maximum or minimum. But it's not asking for that. 
All it wants is the point of diminishing returns, which is our second derivative, which would be 60 minus 12x. So this is the one that I'm interested in. So we're gonna set that equal to zero and solve for x. So 60 equals 12x, divide both sides by 60, or I'm sorry, by 12. So you get x equals five. Okay, now we have to, or let me back that up. I would assume where x equals five, that that is an inflection point. But again, I have to show that it's an inflection point. Now, how do we know if it's an, an inflection point? Let me put x equals five. My second derivative was equal to zero. So this has to be concave up and then down or concave down and then up. That's the only way. If this is concave up and this is concave up, then we do not have an inflection point. So I'm going to use a number to the left of five. Zero is always the easiest. I'm going to put that into the second derivative and it will give me a positive number. So since it's positive, I know this is greater than zero. So I have a concave up. And then I'm going to choose a number to the right of x equals five. So I'm just going to use six, plug that in. And now I get a negative number, which means my second derivative is less than zero. So I have a concave down. So it does change from up to down. So sure enough, at x equals five, we have an inflection point. Now it's not asking for the point on the graph. We just know that yes, here is my point of diminishing return, but it's at not at $5. Remember it's hundreds of thousands. So we have to multiply this times a hundred thousand. So this tells the business that here is at the amount that it was profits work at ex accelerating when you hit spending $500,000 at advertising, it is still increasing. It's just slowing down. Okay. All right. So we've done a couple of these with polynomials, the radical one, or I'm sorry, not the radical, the rational ones when it's a fraction takes a little bit more work. So this is a fairly extensive example. So we're going to do a function x over x squared minus four. And of course we know this is a rational function. So we're gonna to have to consider the possibilities for when the denominator does not exist. All right, so what we're gonna do first is the first derivative. And if you recall, that is low times the derivative of high minus high times the derivative of low all over the denominator low squared. Now we need to clean up that numerator a little bit. So I'm going to distribute one. So we get x squared minus four minus two x squared all over x squared minus four to the second power. And then I can combine like terms. So my first derivative is equal to negative one or negative x squared minus four all over x squared minus four squared. Okay, there's my first derivative. So now what we need to do is we need to find the critical values or the critical numbers. Now, since we have a rational um, function, we have to consider two things. So you need to be careful here. We need to consider when the denominator equals zero, because what that would mean is our critical numbers or um, is that our critical numbers occur when the first derivative does not exist. We also need to consider when it would possibly be zero. 
And that would be when the numerator is zero, but the, the denominator is a numerical value. So at that point, your first derivative would equal zero. All right, so let's take a look here. So we're going to do does not exist. So consider the denominator. So I would need the denominator to equal zero. And of course, if I substituted negative two in for X, I would have negative two times negative two, which is four, four minus four is zero. That gives me a denominator of zero. So I know it occurs when it is negative two. If I put in positive two, I would get two times two is four, four minus four is zero. So the denominator or the function does not exist when X is equal to positive or negative two. Is there a number that I could plug in to X here to where I would get zero on the numerator, but I would not get zero on the denominator? Um, well, if you look, even if you put in two, two times two is four, but that would actually be negative four minus four, which is negative eight. So there's not anywhere that I can get the numerator to be equal to zero. So this is not applicable. So I do not have to consider anything with this. Okay, so my first derivative. And we have negative two. And this is when the first derivative is undefined or does not exist. First derivative is undefined or does not exist. So now I wanna know what is going on in each one of these intervals. So I'm gonna choose a number to the left of negative two. So I'm gonna do negative three, a number in between negative two and two, and I am going to choose one, and then I am going to choose three. And we're gonna plug this into um, our original, not our original, sorry, our first derivative. So when you substitute negative three in, you get a negative number. So that tells me the first derivative is less than zero. When I plug in one, I get a negative. So that tells me the first derivative is less than zero. And when you plug in three, you're gonna get a negative as well, which tells you this interval is less than zero. So we have that it is decreasing, does not exist, decreases, does not exist, decreases, does not, or we're done with does not exist, okay? So it's like, wow, what is this one gonna look like? Well, we'll eventually get to Desmos and look at that. All right, so where do my intervals, or what is going on at my intervals, where is it decreasing? Well, that would be this interval, which would be negative infinity to negative two. It would also be this interval, which is negative two to two. It would also be this interval, which is two to infinity. And where is it increasing? None, never increases. So my relative extrema, which means I'm looking for a relative minimum or maximum. Well, I don't have a bottom of the hill or top of the hill. So this would be none as well. All right, so now we want to consider inflection points or concavity. So critical values, critical numbers is first derivative. Now we want to look at concavity, which means we are considering inflection points. So now we're going to look at the second derivative. All right, this one's going to take some work. Let me get to my first derivative. All right, so now we have to take the second derivative of this. And so we are gonna do low
times the derivative of hi. minus hi times the derivative of low. Okay, the derivative of this is gonna take a little work. We bring this two down, so we would have two times x squared minus four to the first power. And now we have to take the derivative of the inside, which would be two x, all of that, over the denominator squared, all right? So you just have to be careful and be intentional, all right? Okay, now, what I want to show you is, um, let me rewrite this. Now I'm gonna rewrite the top. I'm not gonna to start cleaning the top up yet because I wanna show you something that you need to watch for. So I'm gonna rewrite the numerator. I'm recording. Sorry, somebody came to my door. All right, what I do want to do is multiply these and get x squared minus four, and then this would be to the fourth power, okay? All right, now here's what I want to show you. Pay attention to this minus here, and this is a term. This is a term, and then I want you to look at the denominator. Now, if you will notice, this has an x squared minus four. In fact, it has two of them. This has an x squared minus four, not this one because of that negative, but right here it has one of them. And in the denominator, we have x squared minus four, we have four of them. So if they all have the same thing, what I can do is the, the least of it was one. So I can eliminate one here one here, so now this is to the first power, and one here, so now this is cubed. So what we have now, I told you it was gonna take a little bit of work, is we have x squared minus four times negative two x minus negative x squared minus four times and I'm gonna go ahead and multiply this two times two X and just make that four X. All of that is over X squared minus four to the third power. All right, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna multiply and clean up the numerator. So I'm gonna distribute this so I would have negative 2x cubed plus 8x. And then what you have to be careful of, I'm going to distribute the 4x, but think of it as negative 4x, because I also have to distribute this negative through. So that's going to make that positive, and it's going to make that positive. So I'm going to have plus 4x cubed plus 16x, all of that over x squared minus four cubed. And then combining like terms, I'm gonna get two x cubed plus 24 x over x squared minus four cubed. So this right here, this right here, I'm gonna do this, is our second derivative. So yeah, takes a little bit of work. Welcome to a higher level math class. All right, so with all of that, remember now what we're looking for is inflection points. And those occur when the denominator is equal to zero because that means it does not exist 
or it's undefined, or we need to look for when the numerator is zero, but the denominator has a number, and then that would mean zero any over anything is zero. So this would mean the derivative, second derivative is equal to zero, okay? All right, so we're gonna be looking at it here. So I wanna first look where it's undefined or does not exist. So I'm looking at the denominator. What values can I plug into X to where my denominator would be equal to zero? Well, again, it is positive two and negative two. But now I also have to consider, is there a possibility to where the second derivative equals to zero? Now that would occur when the numerator is zero, but the denominator would be a value. Well, since both of these have X, if I put in zero for X here, that would give me zero on the top. Well, if I put in zero here, I would get negative four to the third power, which is a number. So four times four, that's 16 times four. I think it's 64 and it would actually be negative 64. So you're gonna get zero over a value, which means that at x equals zero, your second derivative is zero. So this is where you have to look at all of those possibilities. So now we're gonna do the sine diagram test for the second derivative. And now we have three possible inflection points. So we have at x equals negative two, x equals zero, and x equals two. Now be careful here because at negative two, the second derivative is undefined or does not exist as well as here. But at the, at x equals zero, your second derivative equals zero. So now we wanna know what's going on in all of these intervals. So I'm gonna choose the second derivative of negative three I am going to choose a number between these two, which would be, let's see, I'm gonna use negative one. Then I'm gonna use one. And then lastly, I am going to use three. So what we would do is we would take each of these values, put it into our calculator here and determine if we get a negative or a positive, which tells us concave up or concave down. So what you'll find if you plug those in, this gives you a negative plus negative plus. So that tells me this interval at the second derivative is less than zero. This interval at the second derivative is greater than zero. Here we would have less than zero and here we would have greater than zero. So since this is less than, we have concave down Greater than zero, we have concave up. Less than zero, we have concave down. And then we have concave up. Now remember, inflection points occur when it changes. It went from down to up, up to down, down to up. So those scenarios do happen. But I want to show you something. So come down here, we're going to look for the points, the actual points. So now we're going to do a point generator. So we're going to have to go back to the original function. So we're going to look at that at x equals two, or I'm sorry, negative two, which would be f of negative two is equal to, and I went back to the original function, which was x over x squared minus four. And then I would get negative two squared minus four. Well, if you'll notice, this gives up my denominator is equal to zero. So does not exist at X equals zero. So I go back to the original function. I would get zero over zero squared minus four, which is zero. So we know there is an inflection point at the point zero, zero. And then of course, two is going to end up being just like negative two. And this is going to be does not exist either. So here is my inflection point. So now what we're going to do is take a look at what this looks like on Desmos.
All right, so let me get rid of these. All right, so we're going to go back to our original y equals x over x squared minus four. All right, so I want you to look and pay attention. So think back to when we found the first derivative, which was our critical values, which um, were at negative two and two. And if you'll notice, that would give us a um, vertical asymptote right there because it approaches, but it never um, intersects with it. And if you recall, any relative minimum or maximums, we don't have any in this graph. So then we look at our second derivative. And yes, this interval goes decreasing because this would, if you think this would be like a concave down, this would be a concave up, but we don't actually have an inflection point because they don't intersect other than at zero, zero. Right here, we had a concave up and then it changed to concave down. So this would be our point of diminishing returns, although we're not looking at a revenue function. But So that is your introduction or your lecture over second derivative graphing. So first derivative graphing tells us critical values or critical numbers. And so we're looking at increasing, decreasing, relative minimum, maximum. Second derivative tells us concavity, whether it concaves up, concaves down, and then it allows us to find the inflection point or points.